Good afternoon, everybody. This is Brian Dayton with the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce, and I'm joined today by Mark Carter, the uh, chair of the West Virginia Chamber's Human Resources Committee and a, a partner with Dinsmore and Show here in Charleston. Uh, we wanted to bring this webinar to you today because of a new regulation that is set to take effect uh, in just under two weeks on July 1st that is going to have an impact on almost every single small business in both West Virginia and the nation. So we asked Mark to uh, come on and do this webinar today to discuss what is going to be occurring uh, upcoming right now for people with small businesses, people who are managing uh, business people to really pay attention to make sure that they're up to date on the overtime regulations that are coming out. Um, before I turn it over to Mark uh, to go ahead and begin speaking, uh, we are also going to be able to take questions. I want to just give a, a brief mention. I hope Mark is okay with this. Mark is a candidate for the West Virginia House of Delegates. Uh, he was successful in the May primary uh, last month, so we were very, very excited about that. He is endorsed by the Chamber PAC uh, and has been a very long time active member of the Chamber. Uh, so again, Mark, thank you. I know you're busy uh, taking a little time away from work and away from the campaign uh, schedule uh, to come talk to us today. Uh, just as a reminder, anybody who does have a question, there are a few ways to ask it. You can type it into the chat box or the Q&A box, or if you would like, you can raise your hand and ask it uh, out loud. So uh, again, there's a few ways to ask questions, uh, but Mark, again, thank you so much for being here with us today, and I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. Brian, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to everyone who's tuned in to listen to this presentation. I'm going to be try. I'm going to try my best to be brief. Matter of fact, uh, and I want to focus on the reality that what I'm doing here this afternoon is primarily making you aware of a very significant development in federal labor law. Uh, this is uh, involves overtime and Department of Labor regulations, they are very fact intensive. So it's gonna be difficult for me to give you legal advice that you can rely upon. Rather, I'm gonna to try to make you aware of the uh, developments that have occurred and make sure that I encourage you to speak with uh, your employment counsel if there is a significant issue that you are unaware of. But the most important thing to report on is simply the existence of this regulation. It was passed on April 23rd, 2024 by the Biden administration, Department of Labor and its wage and hour division. And it dramatically changes how we characterize employees as either exempt or non-exempt from the protections of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Just to recap, what you likely already know, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the federal law, if an employee is exempt from the protections of the act, that means they're not protected by the statute and they are not eligible for mandatory overtime compensation of one and a half times their base wage rate when they work in excess of 40 hours a week. You could pay those employees a salary uh, and they're not entitled to mandatory uh, increased overtime compensation. If an employee is non-exempt, then they are eligible because they are covered by the, the statute, protected by the statute. And with regard to those employees, if they're not exempt from the act, then you have an obligation to pay them one and a half times their normal hourly wage rate uh, for any work done over 40 hours in a single work week. Uh, and that can result in significant uh, compensation, and it, it is uh, desired by employees. Well, the Biden administration wants to make more employees eligible for protection under the FLSA, and thereby more protection and more compensation when they work overtime. There are many exemptions under the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act for mandatory overtime and the definition of uh, who a non-exempt and an exempt employee is. And one of them is for white collar employees. We're gonna to focus today on white collar employees and highly compensated employees. White collar employees uh, are employees who work as executive employees, administrative employees, and professional employees. And to be exempt, three conditions must be present for an executive, administrative, or professional employee. 
that employee has to be paid on a salary basis. The salary must be above a specific threshold amount. Currently, that amount is $35,568 a year. And the employee must satisfy the duties specified for whichever classification under which they are described as exempt. And there, it, it, as I noted, it, there are a lot of different factual questions that are relevant to that determination, but they're called executive, administrative, and professional employees. The other type of uh, exemption is the highly compensated employees exception. To be exempt, those employees must meet the following tests. They must perform office work. They're, that employee must perform only one of the duties associated with the executive, administrative, or professional classes of employees, and that employee is paid a salary that qualifies them as a highly compensated employee. And that's this is a much smaller group, but it's still relevant. And you likely today have already determined whether an employee is exempt or non-exempt on the basis of those two uh, types of tests. Here's what's going to change in two weeks, less than two weeks, on July 1st the new regulation changes the salary thresholds for these classifications. So for executive, administrative, and professional employees, on July 1, the threshold will change from the current $35,568 a year to $43,888 a year. And that's a significant bump. So there may be a substantial number of employees who you currently employ who make over 35,568 but under 43,888 those employees as of July 1 are going to be entitled to overtime mandatory overtime payments of one and a half times their basic wage rate and you'll have to determine what it is on an hourly basis and you'll need to keep track of how many hours they work in a week because if they work more than 40 hours a week and you don't pay them oh, the mandatory overtime rate, that could result, that would result in substantial liability. But that's not all. While that change is going to become effective on July 1, another change in the salary threshold will occur on January 1 of next year. And then the threshold will change from $43,888 a year to $58,656 a year. So for employees that you have today who are making more than 35,568, uh, but less than 58,656, you're going to have to pay those employees as of January 1, a mandatory time and a half in overtime. Now with regard to the highly compensated employees, that threshold is changing as well. The current threshold is $107,432 a year. If they make uh, less than that, then, uh, then they are a, uh, a, a non-exempt employee. If the employee makes more than $107,432, they are exempt from the act. But on July 1, that number will change to $132,964. And, $132, and on January 1, 2025, next January 1st, it will move up again to $151,164 a year. So we literally could have employees who are making over $150,000 a year. We will have employees who are making over $150,000 a year, who will be entitled to time and a half mandatory overtime payments under the new uh, thresholds established by the overtime regulation. And unfortunately, that's not all. The, the regulation contemplates and will require continuing escalations every three years, beginning on J July 1 of 2027. And those increases are not set yet. They will be set by the federal government based upon uh, wage data and salary data that is collected by the federal government in the fashion that they believe is most appropriate. 
So to remain exempt, employers must either, or to remain in compliance with the law, employers must either one, increase an employee's salary above the new threshold as it changes in order for those employees to remain exempt or reclassify the employee to hourly calculations of time to enable overtime payments as the employee will become non-exempt. And those changes begin again on July 1. If they become non-exempt, employers must manage the employee's time to control both the amount of overtime expenses they'll incur, as well as to remain uh, in compliance with the basic overtime laws to ensure that you do pay them if they uh, earn overtime. Now, is this thing a certainty? Well, nothing certain in today's world. Uh, there are challenges that are ongoing in both Congress as well as in the courts. In Congress, there is a bill that has been introduced under the Congressional Review Act. The Congressional Review Act allows Congress to overrule an administrative regulation that has been enacted by the, uh, the administration of the current president. The, the reason I don't think anyone should have any hope that that uh, legislative effort will be successful is because in order to become law, in order for the Congressional Review Act a bill to become law, it would need to be signed by the president. And the likelihood is that the president is not going to uh, overrule his own administration's regulation. The more likely means of relief is the, uh, the court challenge. There is a court challenge which is going on in federal court in Texas to challenge the constitutionality of this, uh, uh, this regulation. And you should know that the Obama administration similarly created an escalator clause in a increase in the threshold for overtime, and it was ruled unconstitutional. So at least with regard to that portion of the regulation, there is a reason to have some degree of optimism that the challenge will be successful. Uh, and you, you never know. This is going to be in federal court in Texas. Uh, undoubtedly, the court was picked, the district was picked, because it would be the most receptive to these types of arguments. But there are no assurances. I'm going to keep Brian aware of whether or not there is any type of uh, judicial determination that would stop the enforcement of these regulations. Uh, and typically they come in in the last minute uh, with regard to several several other regulations that have been challenged. So we'll, we'll find out as we uh, go ahead, but if anybody wants to, the, the cases in the Eastern District of Texas, it is, uh, it's docket number is four colon 24 dash CV dash four six eight. And again, I'll get that information to Brian if you want to follow it yourself. Uh, the U.S. Chamber is very active on this issue. They are they are filing an amicus brief in that piece of litigation in Texas. They're obviously at work on the Hill with regard to the Congressional Review Act uh, legislation. They do not believe that this uh, regulation is necessary or in the interests of their membership. And so there, the challenge is ongoing. And the U.S. Chamber, frankly, has been incredibly successful in the past in dealing with issues of this nature. So I'm hopeful that uh, that they also may have some type of uh, success. But uh, as of right now, it is on track for passage. What should you be doing right now? Making sure that you're aware of it, that you plan for it, and that you speak with your employment counsel in order to ensure that you have a, an expert analyzing the facts of your compensation system with regard to the employees that you have that may be impacted to ensure you're doing the right thing. And the right thing always is following the law. I hope that's helpful. If there are any questions, I'm hopeful to try to deal with those at this time. Sure, Mark, <clears throat> it looks like we have a couple questions in the queue and then I have some written down as well. Um, let's just go ahead and take the first one. Uh, it was an anonymous attendee. I have a particular question. If a salaried employee makes approximately $8,000 in tips, 
can this offset the salary requirement? Uh, the employee that in question is currently at $36,000 and meets the duties tests. So the big question there is, do tips count? And does it change the, the factual analysis with regard to the level of compensation of the employee? And the short answer is yes. Tips and commissions uh, are indeed compensation. They do change the analysis. That might put you into a situation where you're looking more at the work week rather than the annual salary of the employees, which the government is going to certainly uh, you know, presume that you're able to, to do that. So, for example, currently, if an employee makes $35,568 a year, that's about $684 a week. So if an employee with tips is making more than $684 a week, does that mean that they have uh, passed the, the salary threshold such that they are entitled to time and a half? It could, uh, but it depends on a lot of different variables, including what their, their job is. Most tip positions are dealing with uh, weight service personnel, and those personnel have a, a very different type of compensation system anticipated by the FLSA. So short answer is it could. The best answer is I encourage you to speak with your employment counsel uh, in order to determine what uh, the actual impact on your workplace and your employees is. Thank you, Mark. Um, next question we have is from Jill Parsons. Uh, she says, I saw some language from another summary that uh, if you're an employer with under $500,000 in gross volume, that it may not apply to you. Have you seen anything with this? Uh, and is there any difference if you have a for-profit or a nonprofit entity? I'm not aware of any differences on for-profit and nonprofit on the $500,000 a year threshold. I'm not familiar with it. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Again, I would encourage you to contact your employment counsel on that. Thank you. Um, next question would be, what's the impact of state law? Because West Virginia does have a state wage and hour law. Uh, however, uh, state law uh, cannot limit federal law. So how do those two lay in with each other uh, and play under this new rule? All right. So that is a, is a great question. State laws can have an impact on the enforceability of the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, in that state laws that are more protective of employees than the federal law is will be enforced by state agencies or can be enforced in state courts by employees independently of action by the United States Department of Labor. Uh, there are several states that have more protective state wage and hour laws than the Fair Labor Standards Act, but they are the states you would almost naturally presume would have those types of statutes, Alaska, California, Colorado, Maine, and Washington are those states. Ours is not. So the, the FLSA, particularly with regard to these new salary thresholds, is uh, not as, the FLSA is more protective than the State Wage Payment and Collection Act. So the State Wage Payment and Collection Act, as Brian said, will not uh, in any way impede the enforcement of the federal government enforcing federal law. Thank you, Mark. Um, I have a couple more questions jotted down that have been uh, texted or emailed to me. Uh, before I get to those, just a reminder to anybody, if you do have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box uh, or the chat box or raise your hand. So uh, I'll give everybody a little time to think about that. Um, a question, Mark, uh, is how would these new regulations impact employers who may give annual or quarterly performance bonuses? As I mentioned before, bonuses, tips, commissions, all factor into the annual compensation thresholds of this uh, regulation. So a bonus, bonuses are divvied out in various ways. They may be awarded on a monthly basis. They may be awarded on an annual basis, uh, or there may be some other type of bonus system that an employer uses. That is going to come, in, that will have an impact on whether or not this is a work week type of analysis or an annual salary type of analysis. 
But the one thing that's going to be consistent with that is it's going to have an impact on the annual threshold of the employers of the employees' earnings. And it could, depending upon how it is structured, uh, increase that employee into a situation where they will be entitled to time and a half as a uh, non-exempt employee when currently they are exempt. So they count. That's the important thing. Don't ignore commissions, tips, or bonuses. Ensure that you are factoring those into the analysis. Sure. Another question we had, Mark, uh, kind of relates to um, flexible employees. And I think I can see two categories. You have your standard, you know, your wage base, but then highly compensated. Let's say you have employees right now who uh, may enjoy flexible time where, hey, I'm going to take Friday off and I'm going to work instead of eight to four next week. I'm going to work eight to six Monday through Thursday so I can do that without taking vacation. Will this have an impact on employees' ability to be able to do that? Again, that's a great question because an employee is is going to have employers are required to establish a normal work week for an employee. Uh, and it's generally going to be divided up into seven days and employees generally get two, at least two days off. You're talking about a situation where an employee may be working four of seven days or even three of seven days and working longer hours in the interim. Well, the employee is still going to be entitled to mandatory overtime if they are not exempt from the FLSA for work in excess of 40 hours in a basic normal set work week. So even if they're working, you know, 12-hour uh, shifts, three days a week, as long as they don't go over 40 hours a week, they're not entitled to the uh, time and a half. Now, it may be your practice to give them time and a half, uh, but what I'm focused on here is when it's going to be mandatory under the law. So while it could have an impact, Brian, I don't see that as having as large of an impact as some of the other questions you identified regarding tips, commissions, bonuses, et cetera. Sure, makes sense. Um, <clears throat> At this time, I just I don't have any other questions in the queue. Uh, again, you know, uh, if anyone has something right now, uh, you know, throw your hand up or, or oh, I just had one pop in. Um, so just as a reminder to anyone, if you do have one, go ahead and get it typed into the Q&A box or raise your hand. But we did get one just now. Um, if we keep our salaried employees through July 1st, but the increase in January does happen, how would that affect us at that time to reclassify? If you keep your salaried employees salaried through July 1st and they're cha they're not impacted by the change in the threshold amount, but they are impacted in January 1, 2025 by those thresholds, then you're going to need to comply with the statute. I mean, the regulation. You simply need to com comply with it. Now, what the federal government suggests, which is a little unrealistic perhaps for especially a small business is, well, just raise their rate, just raise their salary. So if you raise their salary above the threshold, they remain exempt and you don't have to pay them overtime. That may be a significant challenge given the nature of your business and how much revenue you bring in. So, uh, and that's one of the bases of attack that uh, is being uh, brought forward in the courts. Uh, but, you know, it's a pretty, it can be at its basic amount, a very, very simple analysis. If you pay an employee a salary and the salary currently 36, 37,000 a year uh, leaves them exempt, then you don't have an obligation to pay time and a half. In July 1, that'll change. So if you pay an employee less than 43 uh, and change, which is what it's going to be changing to 43,888, uh, you're going to have to pay them overtime for any time worked over 40 hours in a set work week. Sure. 
Mark, we just got another question. Somebody who um, had to jump on just a few minutes late. Could you just give a quick overcap again of, uh, I know there was a challenge using the Congressional Review Act, but also court challenges and which is maybe the more promising? Sure. I don't, I don't see the congressional challenge being uh, successful under the Congressional Review Act because it ultimately has to be accepted or rejected by the president. The president almost never overrules their secretary, uh, their their own cabinet level member. So I don't see that being successful. The federal court challenge, which is a, uh, a large piece of litigation that's been filed in the Eastern District of Texas and Sherman, Texas, I think has more potential for success. And even there, the strongest argument deals with the automatic escalator aspect of the regulation that would require these thresholds to go up effectively every three years, uh, regardless. And so that that has been ruled unconstitutional in the past. Uh, the remainder of the litigation, we'll find out. Um, it, it makes sense to me, but that doesn't mean it will to the court. And even if it's successful in the district court, it can always be overruled by the circuit court. So. We'll, but that's where everyone is looking. I'll tell you that. That, uh, to me, is the most likely uh, area where employers can get some relief. Now, I, and I wanted to make one other point, if I could, because uh, I did get a question on this regulation. And uh, it was through you, Brian. It was from one of the members. And the member shared with both of us the, uh, a general message that I think is dead on accurate about why the regulation isn't helpful to employers or employees. And that member wrote, in reality, this regulation negatively impacts both employees and employers who do not require or expect more than 40 hours of work per week from their employees. Our company, for instance, offers flexible schedules that allow employees to handle personal matters without docking their pay. Whether they miss an hour of work on Tuesday because their child was sick and they needed to go or they needed to run an errand that took more than an hour or their dog was lost and they had to put up flyers for their lost dog, we accommodate their needs and never penalize them for being human. Now we'll need to reassess exemption terms for employers who care but cannot afford to give $10,000 to $15,000 raises per employee. This is truly disappointing and hoping, I'm hoping that there could be some alternative in regard to commissions and that type of pay structure. Thank you and I look forward to the meeting in a few weeks. Well, I thank you for that observation. I agree with that. I hope that the uh, presentation didn't disappoint you. Uh, but I think that the primary message is, one, make sure that you're in compliance because this thing is going live July 1 in the absence of a favorable court determination. Two, keep on the lookout from, for email from Brian Dayton. And that is something you should always do, but definitely with regard to this issue, keep your eye out for that because Brian may be uh, giving you important news with regard to the outcome of the litigation that will literally change the whole way that you compensate many of your employees. Thank you, Mark. And, and I know uh, our comms team, uh, Kaylin George, has been all over this as far as uh, making sure to push information out, and we will continue to to do that. Um, we, we had another question that came in, and I think it's been partially uh, answered. Uh, just to clarify, though, um, you know, right now, if there's, can flex time be approved? I think the answer was, if an employee works over 40 hours in one week in order to take some time off the next week, if they're going to fall into those categories, they would be required under this regulation to be paid over time. Is that correct in my understanding? Correct in your understanding. The whole thing revolves around how many hours per structured work week that employee is working. And if they work more than 40 hours and they their salary is above the threshold, uh, then they are going to be uh, considered uh, non-exempt and they will need to be compensated time and a half for overtime. Yes, thank you. 
I don't see any other questions uh, in the queue. Uh, if you think of a question after the fact, uh, you can email me at bdayton at wvchamber.com and I will uh, work with Mark to get you an answer. We will continue to monitor this and make sure that we're pushing that information out. Uh, every Thursday, we publish a news update, which, is, as Mark said, that was a great endorsement. You should be looking at that. It contains a lot of good information, but we are going to continue to track this. If there is a uh, success in a court challenge that halts this, uh, we'll be sure to let you know. Likewise, if it's going to go into effect, at least the first step on July 1, uh, we'll, we'll be making sure to put out a reminder that uh, it is still planning to go into effect that date. So again, Mark, thank you so much for taking time. This was extremely helpful. Um, really appreciate that. And uh, do you have anything uh, you wanted to close with before we wrap up? Uh, I'm just grateful to the chamber as always, not only for the opportunity to visit with you all, but also for the very, very good work that they do on your behalf and on behalf of the state. Uh, the chamber is a tremendous force in our West Virginia legislature. And if I happen to be elected, they will be an even stronger force. So thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mark. Well, uh, appreciate it, Ruben. Uh, we'll try to give you a few minutes back on your day. And, uh, and this webinar was recorded so that we will be able to go ahead if you missed it or you wanted to show a coworker so they can also get caught up. Uh, it will be available. We will be sharing that out as well. So again, thank you, everybody, uh, for tuning in today and have a great rest of the week. Thank you.